Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's show, we place our eye on Jewish business at CD Heaven, talking about today's trends in music. But first, we're at the Professional Advisory Committee of the Boca Raton Federation, talking about Jewish philanthropy, right after these messages. here tonight at the Professional Advisory Committee function for the Jewish Federation. Please tell us a little bit about your role as the Vice Chair of the Committee. Sure, I'd be happy to. We're a collection of financial professionals in the, in the industry, CPAs, attorneys, uh, and insurance planners, and my role is to help organize and educate our professionals to help direct gifts, a future gift or a present day gifts, uh, to the Federation and the Foundation. Uh, the ultimate goal of the PAC is to educate our members, the professionals, to ask the question to our clients when they're doing their estate planning documents, when they're doing beneficiary designations, have you named the Federation as a beneficiary in your estate planning documents? Ask the question. Clients will either say yes and give something, they'll say no, well then it's over, or then you ex explain, they'll say why, and then we'll be able to tell them why they should be by donors. Well, the PAC is involved with educating our members as well as our clients about giving to the Jewish Community Foundation, the Federation, and the uh, community of Israel at large. So we're about sharing the knowledge of what the Federation does and educating others. It has grown exponentially over the last five years. We have so many more members. We have uh, um, expanded the group, so it's not just attorneys and CPAs. We have investment advisors. We have insurance professionals. We have trust officers. Um, we have um, been recruiting very heavily over the last few years. And uh, so it has grown to over, I think, uh, almost about 100 people right now. Um, we are really the guiding force on getting the endowments for our community, Jewish community, the PAC people, we educate them and um, they actually go out to their clients and try to pick up endowments and uh, we've been very, very successful. A lot of what has come in has come in from our PAC members. By bringing the donors to the Federation to set up the Charitable Remainder Trust, Charitable Lead Trust, gift annuities, cash endowments, this will help the Federation Foundation as it grows and and uh, goes into the next generation. What do you hope to achieve here in the community of Boca Raton? Well, the Community Foundation is the savings account for the Jewish Federation. And the goal is to build the savings account for our community. And of course, our community serves Jews here, Jews abroad, Jews throughout the uh, world. So we're trying to build our endowment to as large as possible so that we have a nice pot for the future, for future generations. It occurred to me recently that individuals like myself who've been involved with uh, the Federation and the Foundation for many years sometimes don't realize that there are still many people in our community who really don't understand what we do. Bottom line is, Federation raises money to help Jewish people here in our community, in Israel, and in more than 70 countries worldwide. A lot of people have heard me refer to the Federation as the checking account, and we are the savings account. That is the foundation is the uh, savings account for the uh, Federation. And what we do is we fund specific projects that will be used now and in the future. We meet the unexpected needs that may arise, and we ensure the longevity and continuity of our community for generations to come. The Federation system was built on the central Jewish principle that no Jew would have to stand alone during the time of need. From these proudly and deeply held traditions that our parents built for our Federation that sits on our spectacular 110 uh, acre Jewish campus in West Boca that serves our children, our elders, Holocaust survivors, those with disabilities and other Jews in need. The reality is that many of the people who have been, drive, have been the driving force in our Jewish world have passed on. A testament to this fact is the sharp decline in the number of donors of our Federation. In the last 12 years, we have gone from 20,000 donors to just 8,500. 
uh, donors. That's why the Jewish Community Foundation is so important, and that's why our professional advisory committee is so important. As a Federation supporter, you make some pretty amazing things happen. You feed people, you provide shelter, you support those who long for a Jewish education, and you advocate for those who are denied the full expression of their Judaism. You rescue people in crisis, you speak out against anti-Semitism, a nuclear Iran, and social injustice. You care for our beloved Israel's well-being and security. Last year alone, we fed over 600 local residents, and we made sure 53 of our seniors with cognitive challenges could attend adult daycare and assisted over 160, uh, that, excuse me, 168,000 poor elderly Jews in the former Soviet Union. And that's just a small fraction of what our dollars have accomplished together. So on behalf of the thousands of people who, whose lives have improved because you care, I want to say thank you. I think the biggest thing is uh, bringing the, the Jewish community together in a professional manner to, to provide you know, their clients uh, with some direction to give money. That's the biggest thing, to, to a nest egg for the, uh, for the local Jewish community to offset you know, both domestic and internationally. And, and that we can do as a professional community, it's unbelievable. I think PAC is one of the most meaningful groups. And, you know, again, it's people who can touch their clients to make a gift. And I'm very proud that I'm in the mitzvah society, which means I've got a client to make a gift to the Federation. So I've actually had a few clients that made gifts. And to me, it's very meaningful because it's, it's one thing if I give a gift, but if I can get somebody else to make a gift, I feel like I've really done a mitzvah. We all have a... Um responsibility to the Jewish community no matter you know what walk of Jewish life we come from and I think I've been pushing off that responsibility for quite a quite a while and obviously you know we all have our responsibilities to different areas of Jewish life schools and and synagogues and so on and so forth but the Federation plays such an amazing role in the lives of Jews in Palm Beach County that I just felt that it was a natural progression for me to take that step and join you know the pack as well so thankfully I will be joining with a couple of colleagues this week who made a joint commitment to join when I joined. And uh, we're looking forward to um, a lot of uh, years of uh, progress and helping the Federation continue its amazing work. Raising money for ch Jewish charities, including the Federation, helps perpetuate the Jewish faith and helps my kids and one day my grandchildren. Joining us today in the studio is Mr. Bruce Harmon, the owner of CD Heaven in Tamarack, Florida. Bruce has joined me today to bring our listeners some news and, and uh, recollections about the music business. Bruce, I want to thank you for being here and sharing a little history and uh, business news about the record industry and the music industry to our viewers. Welcome. My pleasure. First of all, tell us a little bit about how you got into the music business. Uh, we were talking earlier, and I know you've had a career as a disc jockey and on commercial radio before you moved into the retail end. Tell us a little bit about how you got into the music business. Just something I've always loved to do as a child. Uh, got into club DJing, became a disco DJ in the late 70s, and from there got into radio. I worked for some clear channel radio stations in South Florida for a number of years, and uh, I've also done record promotion and retail, which is where I'm at right now, owning my own uh, new and used CD store, as it were. And I know the store also stocks all kinds of uh, DVDs and t-shirts and such. Um, really a great retail location for a lot of people. How did you decide to go into CDs and also selling records? Uh, kind of rolling with the punches, changing with the times. Uh, it's very tough to sell any kind of physical media nowadays with all the streaming and downloading. So I had to diversify. Records started seeing a resurgence. Young people started liking the sound of vinyl. So a couple of years ago, I made the decision to bring vinyl into the store and advertise that we buy, sell, and trade. And in addition to selling CDs, we sell vinyl going all the way back to the 50s. We sell some new vinyl. And we have concert DVDs, rock and roll t-shirts, and some memorabilia. Um, 
I'm just trying to do what I can to stay in business these days because it's much more difficult now than it used to be. So you think this is all the influence of the internet? Absolutely, 100%. Look at all, I mean, look at DVDs and movies. Look at, you know, places like Blockbuster that have had to go out of business because of the internet. So technology is great on one hand. On the other hand, it, you know, can put a hurting to certain businesses. And tell us a little bit about your clientele. Is it an intergenerational uh, type thing? How, who comes in and out of the door? Um, parents bring their children in. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised uh, a lot of the time when kids come in and they go through my dollar and two dollar boxes of records and I'll ask them, you know, flat out, you guys listen to vinyl? And they go, oh yeah, my dad gave us his turntable and we love it and we listen to Led Zeppelin and we listen to the Beatles. And it just makes me feel good that, you know, a thing like a record is kind of, kind of cool again, you know, after years of people only wanting to listen to CDs. So what do you think it is about the classic music, like the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, that can still snag a 15-year-old? Certain music is timeless. I mean, like you just sort of alluded to, we still listen to the Beatles. We still listen to Elvis Presley. 20, 30 years from now, are people going to really care about Lady Gaga, not that they may not, but she's not going to go down as the next Elvis Presley, you know. So good music will always be around. I mean, Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, people are still listening to that. That's true, and a lot of these uh, gentlemen, like uh, Tony Bennett, renewed his career. It just came out this week, uh, yesterday, I believe, with a duets album including a duet with the late Amy Winehouse and, and Lady Gaga. And uh, Rod Stewart re reinvented himself years ago by doing his songbook series of all oldie tunes. And again, it goes back to good music is good music. All right. You know, Bruce, you have to, I guess now, nowadays to be in the record business and CD business like you are, you have to be a bit of a historian. So I know you brought us something of historic interest today, and I just, I just want to touch upon it. Um, tell us what you brought into the studio today and a little bit of the background and its significance. Uh, this album here is called Yesterday and Today by the Beatles, uh, released in the 60s. I'm going to just lift that up for a moment. And when it, was when it was originally released, it had a different cover on it. And this is the cover that it had on it. It's a smaller version. Uh, that cover is referred to as the Butcher cover uh, for obvious reasons. It shows the band uh, surrounded by some babies, and the record company saw it, didn't like it. Well, it was a little too far over the edge, uh, huh? Back then, and maybe even today still would be. Uh, the Capitol Records said we're not releasing it. They destroyed thousands of copies of the original album with that album cover. And the records too, or just the cover? No, just the cover. Um, and they redid the cover, which is the one you just showed up. Um, however, a few thousand of the original covers were saved, and they pasted over the new cover. So anybody that has this version of this album with this cover, which is referred to as the trunk cover, if they look a certain way, they can see the old cover underneath it, and if you if you see you have one with that old cover, it could be worth thousands of dollars. Wow! So everybody should condition. go running to their garage and check those old boxes. I, this one right here, I bought as part of a record collection maybe four or five years ago. So they're out there. People just have to know what to look for, or find someone who's reputable and you know see if you know they can tell just yeah. by looking if at people it. do want to question you or find out more information how could they reach you and and if, if they need to determine what they really have uh they can send me an email my email address is cd heaven west all one word cd heaven west at bellsouth.net or we're on facebook 
which is www.facebook.com slash CD Heaven. Bruce, I know there are also um, some CDs that have quite a backstory and such. Uh, tell me about this uh, new custom of them putting much more music on CDs, like the, with two or three albums. W- what's all that all about? Are you referring to deluxe editions and, and things the of that nature? And stuff coming from Europe? Uh, in the case of deluxe editions, when, when a landmark album uh, hits an anniversary, Um, the record company that originally put it out will reissue it with bonus tracks and maybe live versions, demos that were recorded during those recording sessions to commemorate the anniversary of the original release. And do people come back and rebuy that CD so they have that extra material? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, later on this month or next month, the entire catalog by Pink Floyd is being remastered and they're putting out different vi- or they're putting out various configurations for each album such as a single CD version, a double CD version, a version with two CDs and a vinyl record. It uh, it gets to the point where you really got to decide how much of the same thing do you really want. Yeah, basically. maybe it's also part of the industry now just trying to to get new material out there to consumer for, for the market share. That too, that too. All so right. there's arguments for both sides. It's just too much of a good thing. Or, you know, why can't they put out something new that's good? Why do they keep, have to, why do they keep having to go back to the well? Right. Friends, we're gonna take a short break and we will return with more uh, details of all this interesting history with Bruce Harmon. Welcome back. I'm here today with Bruce Harmon. We're talking about his store, CD Heaven, and the music and record business. Bruce, we talked earlier about the, I guess, the negative and positive impact that the internet has had on the entire music business. And it's rather ironic that in the age of technology, now we're spending so much time talking about records and going back to vinyl, um, uh, sort of a throwback and a paradox. but. Tell me, when you take a record into the store, how do you know if someone's going to go come in and buy it? Is it just a shot in the dark? How, how do you run a business like that? It's, you could say at times it's a shot in the dark, um, but for the most part, I'm in the business 30 years. As a kid, I grew up listening to radio when it comes to what was number one on this chart or that chart. I, I don't remember what I had for breakfast, but I can tell you who did, what record, what year it came out, um, and just from knowing my clientele and knowing you know, what they're interested in, I, when I buy or trade for something, I, it's, it's something that I feel I can move. Um, you were telling me uh, during the break about this great Sergeant Pepper find that uh, just came your way. Tell yes. us a little bit about that because I think if there's one album everybody in the world knows about, it's Sergeant Pepper, but uh, we don't know about these variations. I had a gentleman call me on the phone and tell me he had 20 to 25 different pressings of Sergeant Peppers by the Beatles. So I said, bring them on in. He brought them in. And Just explain to our audience what a pressing is, because they might think it's 25 different versions or something. It's the same version, but... So the music is the same. The music is the same, but uh, the fact that it's on Capitol Records, as time went on, Capitol Records kept changing the color of their label from orange to purple to black, and every time they would continue to put an album out, um, it would come out on the new label, so that's considered a pressing. And I've got some import versions from other countries of Sgt. Pepper's. I've got the different U.S. pressings. Some are older, some are newer, and hardcore fans just like to collect various pressings. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, do you get a lot of people who are serious collectors or more people who are just casual listeners and want to do something really different and bring a record? I get both. I get both. And I, I love it when I get the casual listeners, but the collectors, you know, they know what they're looking for and they'll spend some good money to get what they want, 
you'd be surprised. And t tell me about some of the exotic stuff you have in the store now. I know you have some real collectible stuff. We have uh, some picture discs, which, which are actual albums that have pictures embedded in the vinyl. They're not really meant to be played, but they're nice to be displayed via framing and framing them, putting them but on the But they are wall. playable. They're real you records. You can play them. We have some Beatles picture discs. Um, we've got picture discs from various groups. Um, we have that. We uh, also, we carry concert DVDs. I mean, people don't realize that there's a whole genre of uh, music or DVDs for concerts, and you can enjoy a concert by your favorite artist in the comfort of your own home without having to sit with 60,000 people in a stadium sweating your butt off, <laughs> you know? Um, so we sell a lot of that. And, um, you know, we have customers that come in just for records. We have customers that come in just for CDs, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, to try to keep the doors open in this day and age, you know, it's all about diversification. So what do you see for your industry in the future? Do you think it's going to turn around and maybe stores will make a, a resurgence? Or you think it's just... I would love to say uh, the latter. But the reality is that over the next few years, more and more brick and mortar music stores are just going to close. Um, there, are, there is a good amount of people that still want physical media, and by that I mean actual records or CDs. But it's all about downloading and streaming now. And, you know, people want their record collection to fit in the palm of their hand on their iPod or on their telephone. You know, they don't want to store 1,000, 2,000 albums in their house anymore. And it's sad, but the, the fact remains you're never going to get the sound quality from an MP3 or a download that you will from listening to a record or a CD. You're never going to get that sound quality. Bruce, you know, we've talked a lot about re, uh, revisiting the older records that were made. Tell us a little bit about what's happening right now in the record industry, because I know there are companies now actually pressing and selling brand new records. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, once a year, uh, the industry gets together for what they call Record Store Day. And a group of independent record store owners like myself belong to this organization. And record companies uh, release limited edition albums for various artists um, that are only available on Record Store Day through independent stores. And a lot of you know, the major labels that are still around on occasion will put out limited quantities of a new release, not only on CD, but also on vinyl. As I mentioned earlier, um, the Pink Floyd catalog is getting totally remastered and redone, and all of the Pink Floyd albums will not only be reissued on CD, but there will be limited quantities available on vinyl. Um, and diehard record people will go after the vinyl What do you versions. think? Are people buying those kinds of items to listen to or to invest in? To listen to. Today's yeah. vinyl isn't really for investment. And uh, as far as older vinyl goes, not everything is worth something, so you, you really got to know. So what advice would you give people who are not serious audiophiles but can appreciate the difference in the sound? How would they get started with a record collection or even a turntable? What, what would you advise them? Um, they can contact me or look for other uh, used record or CD stores in their neck of the woods. Do you do a mail order business? I do a mail order business. Um, and again, the best way to get a hold of us is via our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash CD Heaven. And um, we ship all over the world. I have customers in Japan, I have customers in Germany. And um, you can buy turntables very, very inexpensively now. As a matter of fact, we carry a line of turntables that can not only be plugged into your standard stereo system, but they come with a USB cable and you can plug them right into your computer and upload the sound of vinyl right to your hard drive on your computer. And I guess that's the best of both worlds. Absolutely. People can have records and enjoy them and still carry it in their iPod. Absolutely. 
All right. Bruce, I want to thank you for being here today, and um, we certainly appreciate your expertise in the business. To our viewers, we suggest that they keep exploring the great music that's out there, the classic music and the new music. Thanks for coming into the studio. Thank you. And good luck in everything, and keep the music going. Rock and roll. That's it for this edition. Don't forget to visit our Facebook page for all the latest news about our program. I'm Lee Lazerson. Thanks for joining us on To Life L'Chaim. <laughs>